Hi everyone, welcome back to another video and we're continuing our series on medicine in folklore and I know it's been a little bit since we've done an episode on this, but I wanted to cover Williams Syndrome today because I think this is one of the inspirations for myths on elves, fairies, fae, pixies, and this one's interesting because in the past few videos I talked about vampires and werewolves and it's pretty easy to see where in history um, humans have seen somebody else as different and labeled them and ostracized them from society, chalked it up to demon possession or something like that as an excuse to hate these people. And with something like the Fae and Elves, it's a bit different because many people have a soft spot for Elves, a soft spot for fairies. They're cute. And we see similar things here with the myths um, because... As you may know, in many traditions, they were not only cute, but they were also seen to be troublemakers and untrustworthy. And so we're going to talk about William Syndrome today and kind of what this looks like in a person and then how this could have translated to the myths that we have developed in society for the Fey and especially their untrustworthiness and that kind of thing. So here we have William Syndrome and... Just getting right into the nitty gritty, there are a lot of details about Williams Syndrome. This is a very complex systemic condition, but we're going to hit on kind of the highlights, the high yield points here. This is by no means comprehensive, so if you want more information, feel free to look into this more. But the etiology of Williams Syndrome, it is an autosomal dominant microdeletion of chromosome 7q1123. So... The important thing here to start off with is that it is autosomal dominant. So if you carry even one copy of this microdeletion, then you will get Williams syndrome. So if you have a family, um, it only takes one parent with Williams syndrome to pass it on. So every offspring would have this condition. So it's, it's pretty likely to inherit it. But this gene involved... Um, on chromosome 7q1123, there are actually about 28 different genes that are involved in this microdeletion, but of note, the biggest one is elastin, the ELN gene. And elastin is related to your connective tissue. It, it, it helps your uh, skin, it helps your blood vessels stay together, it provides the elasticity of your tissue, and that's why elastin can be so important. So if we're missing elastin, if we don't have this elastic fiber in our tissues, or if we have less elastin um, than another person, we could see some issues with this, especially within um, the way we look. This could be related to our heart function, our eye function. Um, and then the other gene that I wanted to mention is LIMK1 or LIMK1, if you want to read it out like that, which has a few different functions. It's related more to actin, which is another um, muscle fiber, but it's also related um, to CNS function and sensory function. So I'm listing this here because we have some sensory things that come with Williams syndrome that could potentially be related to LIMK1. And so that's why I'm listing it here. But how common is this? Uh, this occurs in about 1 in 7,500 live births. So it's actually very, very common, uh, especially if you're getting people um, that get it from one parent and you have pretty much a guarantee of getting it. If one of your parents has it, it's a pretty common condition. We're not talking about something super rare. So some of the features of Williams syndrome, if you were to see usually a child, with this, um, the most descriptive aspect about them is their face. And this is often described as elfin faces. So when you imagine in your brain the picture of an elf or the picture of a fairy, this is probably what you'd think of. Um, you get people with medial eyebrow flare, where their eyebrows kind of tilt inward. You have a broad forehead. you got a short nose. Um, smooth philtrum, and something that's really notable is the stellate iris, which gives them a really cute look of a twinkle in their eye. Their iris actually makes kind of a star shape around their pupil, and this 
can be seen as adorable, can make them look very friendly. In general, this facial appearance does look very friendly, and it does look kind of how we imagine elves and fairies to look. But other things related to this, um, they are often short statured. Um, most of the time, about 75th percentile or so um, with regard to growth. Um, so they are, on average, shorter. And a big thing to note is that they are overly friendly. And this is probably related to the CNS and sensory development. So something with William syndrome is their lack of social inhibition. These people are often very overly friendly. They are described as having like a cocktail party demeanor where they will socialize with pretty much anybody. They have high levels of empathy. They are generally very sociable people and they're also very good with words. They have very good verbal abilities. So some verbal dexterity is something that is heard of a lot in people with Williams syndrome. So you have somebody here with very elfin features um, who's on the small side and very overly friendly. This really does line up a lot with the myths on, on elves and fae. But there are some complications here because, as I mentioned, this is related to elastin. And if you don't have elastin, your tissues can undergo trauma and have some, some serious side effects. So some complications of this, um, you can mainly, in a, uh, about 80 to 90% of these patients, they will have congenital heart abnormalities. Um, the most common one being supravalvular aortic stenosis. Um, you can also get pulmonic stenosis as well and some, some other uh, heart issues, including um, some peripheral vascular issues because they're missing this elastin fiber. But something that does need to warrant um, some investigation and caution with anyone who's taking care of somebody with Williams syndrome is their likelihood for sudden cardiac death. And since this does happen um, with congenital heart issues in 80 to 90 percent of these kids, most of them will undergo some kind of heart procedure between ages two and five years old, and they are at very high risk for sudden car cardiac death because of these abnormalities. Um, but they also can have some renal abnormalities, such as horseshoe kidney. Um, that's kind of one of the more common ones, and they can get high levels of calcium, so hypercalcinosis. Uh, you get nephrocalcinosis from the high amount of calcium that is absorbed due to vitamin D regulation. And then with sensory things um, related to LIMC1, you get hyperacusis or hearing loss, one of the two. These are both kind of opposites. So hyperacusis meaning that they register sound more easily. They are more sensitive to sound, um, which actually can be related a bit to musicality. A lot of these people um, seem to enjoy music, um, or some of them might have hearing loss. Um, and that's just two ends of the spectrum here, depending on how their CNS is affected. Other um, associations are hyperopia um, and strabismus related to ocular function. So not super important to understand, but just knowing that this is a systemic syndrome. I mean, syndrome kind of implies that it is systemic. You have multiple things going on, but the most common ones I've listed here, just so you get a, a better picture of the full scenario. So with this, taking into account the, the myth of elves and fae, um, we know that they're usually, in the stories, they're small. They've got very cute features. They can be very musically inclined and are overly friendly. This is what we saw with William Syndrome. So how do we get this distortion of, of the fae in certain cultures such as Celtic cultures? And this one's interesting, and I think there's something to do with the friendliness of Williams Syndrome. These people who seem to lack social inhibition, they're not following social cues that many of us would. And they have these features that a lot of times when we see someone that is overly friendly or overly cute looking, many people regard that as creepy. Um, for example, dolls in horror films, they're, they're generally very adorable dolls, but in certain contexts can be, can be disturbing to people. 
And I think there's a good level of othering here with, with these people to where we've distorted this condition and we've labeled these people as troublemakers. We've labeled them as untrustworthy because somebody who is that friendly all the time can't possibly be up to any good. There's something going on. There's some ulterior motive to why they're doing that. Um, and their their face is different than me. They have different features. Their eyes have a star in them. Uh, that must be magical. Uh, these people were often associated with magical activity and associated with demon possession. And demon possession is a thing we saw in multiples of these myths. That was a common explanation for differences in in people's interactions and in people's anatomy. They would chalk it up to demon possession. And these people, because of these differences, were labeled as outsiders, and there was something not quite human about them, according to general society. Which, all of this is really upsetting, and I wish that humans could do better about understanding differences, and that we're, we're all different, and that it's okay. But back then, when people didn't understand the science, they didn't have the ability to... Um, get a genotype on somebody and figure out that they had a microdeletion on chromosome 7. They didn't have that. All they had was, this person is different from me, and I don't like it. And so they put these labels on it, and this syndrome has morphed into these myths about Faye and these people who've been overly friendly, maybe, maybe not picking up on social cues as well, maybe having different features now being labeled as not human. And this is why, this is why it's dangerous. This is why we need to do better and we need to study. We need to learn what the truth is because if we rely on our intuition and we get that gut feeling that says, I don't like that person, we're, we can act on that. And we can do something to somebody. We can impact their lives. We can cause suffering to them because of a gut feeling that I had and because of an intuitive thought that I had. Nothing to do with them, nothing to do with the reality of the situation. And so this is why I care so much about this series. And I hope that this is educating you all in why this is important and Next time, I'm not sure what myths we're going to go into next. I think we're going to cover some of the issues with the Salem witch trials because there is some medicine there. And I will see you all in the next one.